Coming up on New Day at Arirang. South Korea is set to see over 100,000 new COVID-19 infections on Friday as Omicron spreads rapidly across the nation. Meanwhile, authorities are about to announce new social distancing measures in the coming hours. The U.S. is again warning that Russia could be on the brink of invading Ukraine. Russia fired back, saying it's seriously concerned about the rhetoric coming out of the U.S. government and the Western media. And over at the Beijing Winter Olympics on Thursday, South Korea had two figure skaters finish in the top 10 in the women's singles event for the very first time. Yu Young secured sixth place and Kim Yerim came in ninth. Hello and welcome to this Friday edition of New Day at Arirang. I'm Mar Broom. Thank you for joining us. And I'm Kim Mogan. It's 8 a.m. in Seoul, Korea on February 18th. Over the next hour, we'll take a look at the big news stories of the day and get expert insights on the issues facing Korea and the world. We are going to start with the COVID-19 situation in South Korea, which is worsening by the day. Omicron spreading like wildfire across the nation. Officials forecasting yet another record number of daily infections on this Friday, this time in the six-figure range for the very first time in South Korea. For more, our reporter Shin Yen is here in the studio with us. Good morning, Yen. Good morning. So we're expecting six figures today for in, in terms of infections. That's right. We're expecting to see the daily caseload possibly go as high as 110,000 because up to 9 p.m. Thursday, more than 100,870 people were infected with the virus. Just three weeks after we saw figures hit the 10,000 range, numbers have increased tenfold. The number of critically ill patients has also hovered in the 300 range for three consecutive days. On Thursday, we saw this figure go up by 76. The number has the potential to keep rising from this week, though, but the silver lining is that authorities say currently they have the medical capacity to handle up to 2,000 critically ill patients. A little over 28 percent of ICU beds are occupied right now. Also, authorities were confident that the at-home treatment system is going well, but some have shared their complaints that things aren't going as smoothly as authorities make it seem, especially with the sudden surge of at-home patients. As of Thursday, over 310,000 people were being treated at or in isolation at home, which equates to 9 out of 10 people who recently contracted the virus. Some of those said they couldn't reach their designated health officials over the phone because the line was always busy. And to make sure there's enough medical staff to help people who require treatment, the government has asked more local hospitals and clinics to provide at-home treatment monitoring and phone counseling. So given the current situation, what are officials saying about these plans they had, at least, uh, to start easing the social distancing guidelines? Well, first off, the government has said it will introduce new changes to social distancing guidelines to minimize the damage to the economy and society as a whole. We'll get to hear what these new measures are in the coming hours. Over the past week, health authorities reviewed raising the cap on private gatherings to eight people from the current six and allowing restaurants and cafes to stay open an hour longer until 10 p.m. But this may not happen following discussions at the 8th Special COVID-19 Transition Committee meeting on Thursday. Thursday. Now, this committee is made up of small business owners, health officials and economic experts. And during the meeting on a day when Korea saw yet another record high number of new infections, committee members had different opinions on the right time to ease measures. While economic experts and business owners said social distancing measures should be eased immediately, officials working on the medical front said now is not the right time. Those against easing measures said if measures were to be eased, the number of new COVID-19 infections would most likely spike, creating a situation authorities aren't prepared for, which is actually a popular opinion among many health experts. We'd be risking too much if we ease measures right now. Measures need to be eased after we confirm the surge has come down and we're certain that our medical capacity can handle the situation. After the meeting, health authorities are reportedly reviewing a new direction, extending business operation hours to 10 p.m. as they said they would, but keeping social gathering caps to six people, and they'll release their final decision this morning. Now, moving on to the vaccination front, I hear that some people will be able to reserve for their um, Novavax shots beginning next week. 
That's right. People aged 18 and up who haven't been vaccinated can make their Novavax shot reservations on Monday. And Novavax is the first protein subunit vaccine to be manufactured in the country. This means that it uses a more traditional method like those used to develop vaccines for hepatitis B and cervical cancer. So watchers say uh, there are fewer concerns about side effects, which is particularly good news for those who haven't gotten their shots or had to stop in between due to side effects. Novavax vaccines can be used as boosters and mix and match mix and match shots. Inoculations will start from March 7th. And once people reserve the date to get their first shot, the date for when they can get their second jab will automatically be reserved to three weeks later. All right, Ian, thank you for the report. Have a great weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Moving on. A new study out of the United Kingdom shows people who've had COVID-19 are more likely to develop depression or anxiety. And according to a study published by the British Medical Journal on Thursday, COVID-19 patients saw a 35% increase in risk for anxiety disorders and 39% for depression. It also showed risk for opioid use increased 76 percent, while the risk for cognitive decline jumped 80 percent. The study was conducted on 150,000 Americans who contracted COVID-19 between March 2020 and January 2021. The U.S. is again warning that Russia could be on the brink of invading Ukraine. The Biden administration says the threat of a possible invasion is, quote, very high. The Kremlin fired back, saying it's seriously concerned about the rhetoric coming out of the U.S. government and Western media. Kim hyo tells us more. The Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe monitoring mission says tensions in eastern Ukraine may have eased somewhat in recent days. However, the head of the OSCE special monitoring mission in Ukraine said some 500 explosions were recorded between Wednesday evening and Thursday morning. This comes as Russian-backed separatists and Ukrainian government forces traded accusations of firing shells across the ceasefire line in eastern Ukraine in what Kiev said appeared to be a, quote, provocation. As tensions simmer, U.S. President Joe Biden on Thursday warned the threat of a Russian invasion is very high for numerous reasons. Very happy because they have not, they have not moved any of their troops out. They've moved more troops in. Number one. Number two, we have reason to believe that they are engaged in a false flag operation. They have an excuse to go in. Every indication we have is they're prepared to go into Ukraine, attack Ukraine. However, President Biden insisted there was a diplomatic path to resolve the crisis. He said this is what his top diplomat told the U.S. Security Council. In a surprise appearance at the U.N. on Thursday, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken laid out the potential steps U.S. officials expect Moscow could take. Russia plans to manufacture a pretext for its attack. This could be a violent event that Russia will blame on Ukraine or an outrageous accusation that Russia will level against the Ukrainian government. Criticizing Washington's rhetoric, the Kremlin expressed concern over the escalation of tensions that it says are partly inflamed by comments made by the West. Moscow decided to expel the U.S. deputy chief of mission to Russia without elaborating on why. Russia's foreign ministry also called on the U.S. to stop supplying weapons to Ukraine. In a written response to Washington's security proposals, Russia outlined a series of demands it says needs to be met in order for a de-escalation. These include the withdrawal of Western military advisors and instructors from Ukraine. In Europe, EU leaders showed unity on implementing tough sanctions on Moscow should Russia invade Ukraine. At a summit Thursday, the 27 EU leaders discussed diplomatic ways to try and resolve the standoff. Kim Yosan, Arirang News. The U.S. Justice Department has launched a new team to focus on pro probing illicit cryptocurrency schemes carried out by cyber criminals and nation states, including North Korea and Iran. Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco says the National Cryptocurrency Enforcement Team will serve as the focal point for efforts to identify 
the misuse of cryptocurrencies and other digital assets. She stressed the cryptocurrency ecosystem must operate in a manner that can be trusted and policed as it's gaining wider adoption. Turning now to our coverage of the Beijing Winter Olympics. On Thursday, South Korea had two female figure skaters finish in the top 10 in the women's singles event for the first time. The Russian skater accused of doping had an off night with errors, finishing fourth place. Kim Dami with Port. South Korea's Yu Young owned a figure skating rink on Thursday, securing sixth place in the women's singles competition. After opening the performance with her strongest move, the triple XL, Yu received the maximum level 4 scores on her step sequence and spins. Performing to Le Miserable by Claude Michel Schamberg, she scored a 74.16 for the technical element score based on jumps and other elements of her routine, and 68.59 in the program component score, which assesses choreography and artistry. When combined with her fourth-place finish in free skating on Tuesday, this left her in sixth place overall with a total of 213.09 points. Kim Yeo-jin finished in ninth place with a total score of 202.63 points. This is the first time two South Korean figure skaters have made it into the top 10 at the women's singles at the Olympics. Two skaters representing the ROC topped Thursday's competition, and 15-year-old Kamila Valieva, the center of a controversial doping scandal, fell twice and stumbled into fourth place. The award ceremony did take place as planned. After the IOC made it clear earlier this week, there would be no medal ceremony during the Games if Valieva finished in the top three. Kim Dami, Arirang News. The dream for a medal is over for the South Korean women's curling team after they failed to qualify for the semifinals. The team, commonly known as Team Kim in Korea, lost on Thursday to world number one Sweden 8-4. The silver medalists at the Pyeongchang Games needed to win their final round-robin match to make the semis, but the loss put them in eighth place. Switzerland, Sweden, Great Britain and Japan will fight for the medals starting Friday. With a couple of days left at the Beijing Olympics, South Korea's speed skating team will wrap up their Olympic journey on Saturday. Cha Min Gyu and Kim Min Sok, who each have already won silver and bronze in Beijing, will race for another medal in the men's 1,000 meter race this afternoon. And on Saturday, the speed skating team will compete in the men's and women's mass start, South Korea is the defending Olympic champion in the men's events. Now it's time for On Point, where we speak to experts to delve deeper into the biggest news stories in the spotlight right now. On Sunday, the curtain will come down on the 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics with the torch to be passed to the next host city, Milan, in Italy. As Tokyo showed us last year, it's never easy to hold such a huge sporting event during a global pandemic. But the general sentiment is that the Beijing Games haven't really gone as planned, at least uh, as well as the Chinese government had hoped, from grim images of ski venues located in the middle of grey-looking industrial sites, athletes' complaints over their treatment and the food, to accusations of cheating by Chinese skaters and even, as we just heard, a very high-profile alleged doping scandal. The Beijing Games have been far more underwhelming than the 2008 Games that were held in the same city. 
Viewing numbers are also sharply down, with NBC admitting 10 million fewer Americans have been watching than the same stage of the 2018 Olympics in Pyeongchang. That being said, some of the sporting achievements have dazzled with countries like Germany, Austria, Norway and Switzerland all scooping lots of medals. For South Korea, though, the medal hall has been relatively low, despite some individual standouts like Hwang dae hun and Choi Min-jung in speed skating. For more, we are joined by Yoon So-hyang, a reporter at South Korea's Chungang Daily. Good morning, and thank you for joining us. Good morning. It's good to be here. So firstly, how have you been finding the Olympics, and why do you think fewer people are turning to watch compared to the previous game? So um, actually today is day 17 of the 20 day long Olympics and we are almost done with three more days to go. But for the last two weeks, the Olympics for me have been an exciting but an unusual ride for sure. And I think it's almost inevitable to compare it with the Tokyo games that took place just last summer. And I personally feel that people didn't pay as much attention to the Beijing games as much as they did for Tokyo. And of course, decreased viewership numbers prove that the Beijing Olympics are on pace to be the least watched Olympics on record. I think there are a few different reasons for that. First, there's usually a breathing period between the Olympic Games, but COVID has changed that paradigm in addition to everything else. The Beijing Olympics were sort of thrown upon us just six months after the conclusion of the year-delayed Tokyo Games. So naturally, negative headwinds remained from the pandemic to a public that disapproves of the politics in China to a lack of big-named athletic stars heading into the Games especially with NHL players not participating to a diplomatic boycott with a not so ideal time window for a large audience focused on the NFL and the Super Bowl in the U.S. Uh, these different reasons combined resulted in significant viewership decline, as you mentioned, and lower interest. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that the athletes and their achievement at the game should also be downplayed. I think that since the Tokyo Games, the interest of Korean Olympics fans have shifted away from the medal count to the process and athleticism. And I also think that the public are channeling that energy to cheer for our athletes regardless of the results. And that's something that is um, positive for us and the athletes. Yeah, I mean, anyone who says they've competed in an Olympics, whether they win a medal or not, uh, that's some achievement in itself. Uh, but for yourself personally, what would you say have been the highlights and the lowlights thus far at the Beijing Games? Right. To start off with the sort of darker side of the Olympics, I think that the lowlights has to be the CAS decision to allow Russian figure skater Kamila Valieva to compete at the Olympics despite a positive doping test. Um, to give you some background, Valieva is a 15-year-old figure skater who quickly became the biggest story of the Olympics after testing positive for a banned heart medication in a urine test taken last December. And of course, there were backlash from figure skating fans, coaches, and commentators that this was a unfair decision, even with figure skating legend Kim Yun Ah posting on her SNS page that athletes with doping problems should not be able to compete. Um, IOC decided that they would not give out medals or hold a medal ceremony for any event that she medals in. And so for the team figure skating event, the United States still have not received their silver medals alongside Japan, who is also waiting for their bronze medals. Um, but to some good news, um, it has once again been proved that Korea is still a short track powerhouse with Choi Min-jung's 1,500 meter gold in addition to Hwang Dae-han's 1,500 meter gold, the short trackers have single-handedly achieved Korea's stated objective of winning one to two gold medals at the Beijing Games. Well, though it was expected that those medals would most likely be won in short track, that both Choi Min-jung and Hwang Dae-han would be able to pull through amidst the crashes and controversies that dominated the early stages of the competition wasn't always a sure thing, which made the two gold medals something of a consolation prize for Korea. 
Well, So Yang, well, in terms of COVID-19, clearly organizers want to be safe. But do you think, you know, the mask safety protocols and venues with um, barely any spectators actually um, stripped, stripped away much of the passion and magic and inci- excitement of the Olympics? Right. In our perspective as viewers of the Olympics, sure, it wasn't the most popular Olympics for different reasons that we've already covered, including that it was during a worldwide pandemic. But I think the more important take here should be how it was for the Olympians who had to compete in something they had prepared for four whole years without any friends and family in the stands. But more importantly, amidst the anxiety that they might not be able to compete if they were to test positive for COVID at any time during the Olympics. And it did happen a couple of times, unfortunately. Most recently, U.S. figure skater and medal hopeful Vincent Zhou tested positive for COVID, costing him the chance to compete in the men's singles figure skating entirely. Um, So for Olympians, masks and frequent COVID testings were, of course, not part of something that they were used to. But that doesn't mean those measures weren't necessary because they were. But after covering the Olympics for the last two weeks, I think that the biggest throw off for them was the possibility of catching COVID and being stripped of their once in a lifetime chance to compete at the Olympics. And to have overcome that anxiety and finish their race on or off the podium I think is itself an achievement that should be celebrated. All right. Um, that was Yun So Hyang, reporter of the Chungang Daily. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Now on to elections. The candidates running in South Korea's March 9th presidential election continue their campaigns on Friday. The candidate for the ruling Democratic Party of Korea, Lee Jae-myung, and main opposition People Power Party candidate Yoon Sa-gyal finished their respective strongholds. Lee will be in Jeollanam-do province, including Mokpo, the hometown of a popular former president from his party, Kim Dae-jung. He will end the day with a rally at the May 18 Democracy Square in the region's biggest city, Gwangju. Yoon will be in Gyeongsangbukdo province and the city of Daegu. He'll hold rallies at the birthplace of former President Park Jung-hee, a popular historical figure among the conservative voters. He wraps up his day's activities with a rally in Daegu, his second trip there in four days. And minor Progressive Justice Party candidate Shim Sang-jung will be in Pohang in Gyeongsangbukdo province, a city well known for being the home of South Korean steelmaking giant POSCO. Her schedule includes meetings with citizens as well as POSCO workers. And An Cheol-su from the People's Party will keep, will keep his campaign on hold following the fatal incident that killed two of his campaign workers. He will be at the funeral site until the burial and is expected to get back on the campaign trail from Saturday at the earliest. Staying with the run-up to the election, ruling party presidential candidate Lee Jae-myung and the main opposition's Yoon suk yeol are running pretty close in the opinion polls. On Thursday, they campaigned in Seoul, considered a toss-up in the March 9th election. Lee stumped in the north of the capital, addressing specific issues that impacts each area. Kim Do-yeon with this report. On third day of campaigning, the candidate for the ruling Democratic Party of Korea, Lee Jae-myung, went to the spot where he stood five years ago when Korea was writing a new chapter in its history, Gwanghwamun Square, where the candlelight protests effectively put his party in the Blue House as a mass movement called for the impeachment of then-President Park Geun-hye. The election on March 9th needs to carry forward this historic change and the wishes of our proud people. That's what the people want. It's what our politicians need to do, and it's the right direction for our country. He also said his vision, if he's elected, is to listen to the people and to lead in the right direction. In the afternoon, he held a rally in an area known for its many individually owned stores. Here at Wang Shimli Station, candidate Yi focused on appealing to small business owners. One pledge he made was that he will extend business hours until midnight for customers who've gotten a booster shot. 
He also proposed more financial support to help the small business owners who've been struggling in the pandemic. Through a debt amnesty, the nation will absorb the debts incurred because of COVID-19. This will make it possible to do business as normal. He reiterated he will increase the current supplementary budget bill to at least 41 billion U.S. dollars. If that can't be done, he said he'll issue an emergency authorization to make the money available to those who need it. For his last rally, he stopped at one of the country's most famous hangouts for young people, the college neighborhood of Hongdae. There he promised to make life better for the younger generation. He said he knows the troubles they face and promised fair opportunities for everyone. On Friday, the candidate will go down to the liberal strongholds of Jeollanamdo province and Gwangju. Kim Do-young, Arirang News. The People Power Party's presidential candidate, Yoon suk yeol is focused on cooling down South Korea's overheated housing market. Yoon was also eager to talk on Thursday about the various corruption allegations surrounding the ruling party's nominee, Lee Jae-myung. Lee kyung un with this report. On day three of the campaign, Yoon sung yeol of the main opposition People Power Party also targeted the capital region, traveling through Gyeonggi-do province and Seoul. And Yu focused on the housing market, the biggest issue of this election according to polls in the region hit hardest by skyrocketing housing prices. At the first stop, Ansung, Yoon blamed the situation on the Moon Jae-in administration. Ansung shows the fourth highest hike in housing prices in Gyeonggi-do province at 38 percent. What's driving up the price? Has your income gone up 38 percent? In Yongin, you made the same rhetoric, calling on the need for a new government. <laughs> Yoon sung yeols other key message directly attacks his main rival, Lee Jae-myung, of the ruling Democratic Party over several corruption scandals. It is seen as a strategic effort by Yoon to mobilize supporters right here where Lee served as former governor. Yoon's offensive on Lee Jae-myung heated up in Seongnam, the very place where the controversial land development took place during his time as the city's mayor. In Seoul, Yoon once again addressed the housing market issues. In Songpago and Sochogu districts, two of the areas with the most expensive housing prices outside of Gangnam. You are not rich even if you own a house that's worth $2 million, because you only have one house and you give all your income to pay taxes on it. Yoon had previously pledged to reduce comprehensive real estate taxes and to supply a total of 1.8 million homes in the capital region alone. Then, Yoon met up with former lawmaker Yoo Seung Min, who vowed unconditional support for Yoon. This completes a united front for Yoon's campaign, with all his former rivals in the PPP primary now part of his campaign, including runner-up in the 2017 presidential election, Hong Jun-pyo. On Friday, Yoon will head again to the conservative stronghold of Daegu. Lee kyung Arirang News. Justice Party candidate Shim sang jong visited Ulsan on Thursday, where she met with local shipbuilding workers. An Chol Su from the People's Party kept his campaign on hold as he continued to pay his condolences to the campaign workers who died unexpectedly and suddenly on Tuesday. Kim Yeon Sung reports. Justice Party Shim sang jongs campaign headed to the southeast. Her team on Thursday visited the port city of Ulsan. The city is home to one of the world's biggest shipbuilding companies, Hyundai Heavy Industries. Here, Shim visited the company's labor unions as part of her efforts to appeal to workers. I promised that I would make a welfare state with a four-day work week. South Korea currently works one month more than the OECD average each year. Shim sang jong also promised to turn Ulsan into the center of green mobility and provide the city with 10,000 electric cars. For candidate An Chul-soo from the People's Party, his campaign is on hold for a second day. Candidate An spent Thursday paying his respects to the deceased campaign workers. Two workers died on the campaign trail on Tuesday with carbon monoxide poisoning suspected to be the cause of death. And on Thursday afternoon, first visited the funeral of the regional election commissioner, situated at Cheonan. 
In the evening, Anne is visiting the funeral of the bus driver in Kimhae. Anne will most likely stay at the funeral site until funeral procession, which is scheduled to take place Friday morning. Kim Hyun-sung, Arirang News. Welcome to Dialogue This Week. In this corner, we invite guests from in and out of Korea to talk about a wide variety of issues ranging from culture and sports to the latest trends around the world. Now, in our previous episodes, we touched upon many Korean TV series that have topped the charts on Netflix. More recently, the zombie thriller All of Us Are Dead has maintained its place on the top spot in terms of hours spent watching the series for three consecutive weeks. And it also ranked third among non-English TV shows that were most watched. But rather than focusing on a single show today, we want to touch upon a relatively new genre that leaves viewers in awe, zombies. As many of us might know, this is not the first time zombie-related dramas have gained no. so much popularity. To name a few, so director no. Yeon Sang-ho's 2016 film Train to Busan and the 2019 Netflix series Kingdom set in the Joseon dynasty were also well-loved by Koreans and also viewers from overseas. So why is the world so amused by zombie-related content and are zombies even real? To answer our questions on zombies, we are joined by Dr. Cameron A. Carlson, spokesperson for the Zombie Research Society, who's also a doctor of public health, and our go-to film critic, Jason Bejervais, both via Skype. Welcome to our show. Thank, Thank you very much. For having Thank you for joining us. Now, let's start with Dr. Carlson. Um, from what I understand, most of us acknowledge that zombies are completely fictional characters brought to light by George Romero's legendary film Night of the Living Dead in 1968. And even in the latest popular Netflix series, We're All Dead, um, the zombie virus was created by a science teacher's experiment that went wrong. So um, how does the Zombie Research Society see these beings? So we see the zombies as more of a, an analog for the worst case scenario. They're, they're human organisms that by either uh, physical or um, biological means have come back to life and now possess just the basal instincts and a very small amount of brain activity. And they, they live to do the basal instinct and that is to feed. So we kind of see them as the worst case scenario and we can tie them into everything. So, um, and also, I, I also want to ask, um, in many films, we commonly see zombies infecting the human population by biting them. So, first I want to ask, what triggers them to bite humans? So, what causes them to trigger to bite humans is, like I mentioned before, it's that instinct to just feed. Um, it's the basic of instincts. It's the one thing that allows you to survive other than drinking water. So, that instinct is to just, if anything comes up that's not a zombie, that they're going to eat it. So they just want to, you know, bite, 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 bite. And that's all they do. Um, they just kind of wander around. And if something comes in, they want to eat it. And that's why they bite. So speaking of biting, um, is it their saliva or blood through the puncture that spreads the infection? Yeah, so it's kind of, you can think of it almost as like the way a vampire transmits vampirism. Uh, a zombie, in order to transmit it, has to bite you. Now, that's a little bit of difference in, if you look at different uh, cultural references like movies, uh, sometimes it's, it's getting the blood in your eyes, such as 28 Days Later, that movie, that's one way it can be transmitted. So it really depends on what kind of movie and what kind of time period that you're looking at. But the way that we look at it is it's a bite from a zombie that turns another person into one. All right. Now, let's turn to Jason. So um, K-Zombies are popular right now because of the Netflix series We're All Dead. But as I've mentioned, there was also the Netflix series Kingdom, the movie Train to Busan, and its sequel Peninsula. Um, so exactly when and how did zombies start being a part of the Korean screen culture? Well, um, they've been around, I guess, since the 1980s. Uh, one of the first Korean films uh, w featuring zombies was released in 1981, uh, Gang Nong-gu's uh, Monstrous Corpse. But it wasn't really until 2016 with uh, Yun Sang-ho's Train to Busan that zombies in Korean films became 
um, immensely popular. Uh, there was also Hashtag Alive that was released in 2020. There's John Sang's uh, sequel, Peninsula, and of course, Kingdom. Uh, there's also the film Rampant that was released in 2018, starring Hyun Bin. It wasn't that popular, but certainly zombies in Korea uh, are a big uh, draw for audiences. Um, I think if you look at some of the successful Hollywood films that have been released in Korea, um, not least uh, uh, World War Z that was released in 2013, that sold over 5 million tickets. Warm Bodies was released the same year. So I think Yon Sang-ho saw an opportunity there and thought, well, you know, clearly zombies do have uh, a yeah, box office um, uh, draw, so why not feature a lot of zombies in my film? And there's also 28 Days Later that Dr. Carlson mentioned, Danny Boyle's uh, British film was released in 2002. Um, that's long had um, quite uh, a lot of affection amongst, amongst uh, cinephiles here, and there's also the Walking Dead series as well. So certainly I think the, the zombies in films and series, I think the ones that have really struck a chord with audiences uh, came from from overseas initially, and then um, Yon Sang-ho uh, trained to Busan. Um, you know, the popularity of that both locally and overseas has certainly had an effect in terms of the amount of content we see featuring zombies. Well, so it has been there for been. decades now. But um, so, Dr. Carlson, now I want to make time for a comparison. So it seems like we. Uh, see a significant difference in the characterization of zombies on screen. The so-called Western zombies are more lethargic, while these K-zombies are rather very active. Can you tell us about the different kinds of zombies? Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> the Western zombies that you're talking about originate from the 1968 film from George Romero. That's how we all saw it. That's how it came out. That's kind of all the, histor the historical references to zombies. That's the way they're portrayed. They, they meander around. They're slow. You see them in The Walking Dead. It's not until much later on in the late 90s, early 2000s with the Resident Evil uh, movies come out that you're actually starting seeing, you know, the K-zombies that we're talking about, the fast movers. It, <clears throat> in the K-zombies, those have become much more prevalent because they're much more terrifying. So World War Z, uh, Train to Busan, uh, Zombieland, all of those in the more recent time frame, those have become the more prevalent ones because they're more exciting, they're more terrifying, they move quick, they're the main threat. Um, so that's kind of where we're seeing the evolution go from 1968, the Ramblers, to now the Sprinters. Then what about you, Jason? So from the films you've watched, what characteristics would you say are unique to K-Zombies? <laughs> well, uh, certainly they're very active. Uh, I remember watching the All of Us uh, Are Dead trailer and I was just really struck by how fast these zombies were moving. Um, and I think if you look at Korean filmmakers and the way they've been influenced by uh, American uh, films and, and directors, they tend to, on the one hand, emulate their style. So we have this zombie genre. But on the other hand, they try to do something new. So, and often the way they do that is to tackle local themes. Um, and it's been interesting to see how these local themes are actually universal themes. So this idea of capitalism, uh, this very competitive culture, and you certainly see that um, play out in All of Us Are Dead. It, it also plays out very well within the confinements uh, of a train in Train to Busan. Uh, and so I think directors are very conscious of the fact that they are influenced by Hollywood cinema, but they want to do something new and try to tailor it towards local audiences. And I think that's one of the reasons why we see these zombies incredibly active. So Jason, what about the latest Netflix series, All of Us Are Dead? Was there anything different about the zombies there? Uh, was it the zombies or something it, about the series that captivated international audiences? Well, I think the fact that it's set in a school is quite interesting. Um, I, I think if you look at the zombie genre, uh, I think it does tend to attract kind of younger crowds. Um, and it reminded me of the Whispering Corridors films. Uh, these are the films that were released in the late 1990s and early to, early to mid 2000. Well, actually, the, the series has continued almost through throughout to, uh, to this day. Um, and 
it's it's interesting to see the fact that it's really kind of set in this school and how it deals with some of the issues facing students and young people. So almost like kind of coming of age. Um, and Netflix, uh, you know, they're, ve they're very um, attuned in terms of who they want to attract. Um, and certainly the younger crowds are, are a big part of their demographic. And I think that's really played out in terms of the success of the series. Now, Dr. Carlson, since you're a member of the Zombie Research Society, why do you think zombies are good subject matter for story writers to use to depict issues in society? That's a great question because, you know, as Jason touched on, it, encapsulate, it encapsulates basically everything that's going on in a particular region or time frame. Uh, in addition, it allows the writers to capitalize not just on zombies, but it also allows them to capitalize on what's even more terrifying in that is the actual human nature, like the dark side, the really, really dark side about where, you know, you pit a normal human being up against a zombie who may have been their wife, their son, their daughter, you know, you name it, and then takes it outside the realm of it strips all social casts, uh, casts away. Uh, removes the money, removes the power, and then it allows them to portray just, if you're in a situation where you need to survive with other humans, what are you willing to do in order to survive? And that, I think, is really what, what writers key on um, in order to make it terrifying, but also really hit home. Yes, because people can, you know, relate to it more. Now, what about you, Jason? The expression "kisengsu" refers to a certain beggarly spirit. Uh, do you do you think the societal depiction of this notion worked with a zombie contagion? Yeah, it does. It's quite it may, it's quite a difficult watch to be honest with you. It makes you feel um, very uncomfortable. I personally, I like the series somewhat, but I had issues with the way some of the the way the director kind of cap captured some of these issues, not least the, the kind of the sexual abuse um, that takes place within the, the school. And um, it's, it's interesting also how it kind of compares to like the film Parasite and, of course, the title Gi Seng Chung. Um, it, it, it invokes this kind of this this. Uh, this mentality that's sort of incredibly competitive and trying to climb up that social ladder regardless of the cost. Um, and there's also Squid Game as well. And I think there's certainly some uh, similarities amongst these uh, uh, series and films uh, in, in terms of the issues that they're conveying. And I think they do uh, tackle some of these uh, these very, very pressing difficulties facing society and the, the capitalist uh, society that we're, we're living in, in some ways it's enjoyable, but also somewhat very, uh, can make us very uncomfortable while watching it. Mm -hmm. Totally can understand what you're saying. But um, now to Dr. Carlson, do zombies evolve? Meaning, um, have they changed since they first emerged as a part of pop culture? And what kind of changes or evolution can we expect them in the future content development? It's actually funny you asked that. I was talking about this with a friend the other day. Um, you see the 19, as we talked about, you see the 1968 George Romero zombies, which were almost humanoid looking. You have them meandering about, you have them, basically you get that guttural noise, you know, you have all of that. And then fast forward, let's just even say 30, 40 years, now you've got Resident Evil, now you've got Zombieland, you've, they've gotten faster, they've gotten smarter, they've gotten more terrifying. You're introducing a whole bunch of different uh, aspects when it comes to now they can jump, now that they can do all these higher level cognitive thinking, um, you know, events. And now you go into Army of the Dead. And so now we're looking at the future because there's one scene in that film that you see the zombies can actually breed. And then they're in a casino and then uh, Dave Bautista shoots one in the head and all of a sudden you see sparks. And unless you're looking at that really hard, you don't catch it. But now you're talking about robot zombies, which I mean, is really out there in, in left field but you're seeing a massive evolution and much more terrifying evolution than what we saw from basically the 1968 kind of cartoonish, but it's the canon to Resident Evil where we all know it was a game and they made it kind of unbelievable to now we move into, okay, now they breed and they're being mechanized. So I think that we're going to see a lot of things in the future that just build on that theme. Um, it just really comes down to what's going to scare people the most and what's going to get people to pay attention. 
But um, before we let you go, I want to ask a rather silly question. Um, Dr. Carlson, um, you're a zombie expert. So when faced with a zombie, what should we do? And um, how do we win against a zombie? Okay, so if you're talking about Western zombies, just walk around them uh, or, you know, uh, smack them in the head and, you know, destroy the brain. However, if you're talking about uh, K-zombies, run as fast as you can or just don't even go outside. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's no point in that one. Uh, you will lose. But that's how you, you – in order to kill a zombie, you have to uh, sever the brainstem or create massive trauma to the head. Um, and, again, if you're talking about K-zombies, they can probably think at this point too. So, you're, you know, you're out of luck. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you for the tips. Well, I'm afraid we'll have to wrap up our discussion at this point. Thank you so much for making time for us, Dr. Carlson and Jason. It was a very amusing discussion. Look forward to speaking to you again soon. Thank, thank you so you. much. It's great to be here. Now, for a look at news from around the world, we turn to our Eason J joining us live from the Arirang newsroom. Good morning. Good morning to you guys. So, Sunze, our top story, France and its European allies have announced that they will begin withdrawing troops from Mali. Give us the latest. That's right. Just like you said, uh, France and its allies fighting against the Islamist militants in Mali will begin their military withdrawal from the country after nearly 10 years of armed unrest. Now, a statement signed by France and its African and European allies released on Thursday noted that multiple obstructions by the ruling military government meant that the conditions were no longer in place to operate in the African nation. Meanwhile, French President Emmanuel Macron stressed that the withdrawal does not mean France had failed its former colony, adding that France's base in Gossi, Manaka and Gao would be closed within the next four to six months. Now, France has had troops in Mali since 2013 when it intervened to drive back Islamist militants advancing on the capital. However, the fight against the Islamist militants will continue in Niger, which agreed to host European forces on the border near Mali and Burkina Faso. Now, the death toll from the devastating mudslide in Brazil has risen to 104 on Thursday, as authorities continue to search for over still 100 still missing. The number of deaths is expected to continue to rise in the coming days and possibly weeks. More than 500 rescue workers alongside as citizens are searching for possible survivors, as many fear the operation has gone from search and rescue to search and recovery. The latest event comes as Petropolis saw the heaviest rainfall since 1932 on Tuesday, causing massive mudslides and flooding. More than 420 people evacuated their homes, taking shelter in local schools and other makeshift accommodation. Meanwhile, President Jair Bolsonaro is expected to visit the affected areas on Friday after his trip to Russia and Hungary. Now, former president of Honduras, Juan Horn uh, Orlando Hernandez, who's wanted on drug trafficking charges in the United States, will remain in custody for at least a month as the extradition case against him continues. The 53-year-old is accused of facilitating the smuggling of some 500 tons of drugs. The drugs were mainly from Colombia and Venezuela and smuggled to the U.S. via Honduras from 2004. Now, Hernandez is alleged to have received millions of dollars in bribes from multiple drug trafficking organizations. A second hearing in the extradition case will be held next month. And finally, an Israeli farmer has been awarded a Guinness World Record after growing the world's heaviest strawberry. At 289 grams, the strawberry is roughly five times the average weight of an ordinary strawberry. The Guinness World Record reported its size as being 18 centimeters in length, 4 centimeters thick, and 34 centimeters in circumference. Now, the record-breaking farmers say cold weather conditions in early 2021 slowed the ripening process, allowing for the giant strawberry to continue gaining weight. Now, the record-breaking strawberry was found a year ago and kept in a freezer until the record was confirmed.
Good morning. The deep freeze that hit Korea all week should ease this afternoon. Well, but cold wave alerts are still in place across the central regions this morning, but should become much more bearable by the afternoon. Meanwhile, dryness seems to be getting worse. Central regions Gyeongsangdo, Jeollanam-do province are under a dry weather advisory, so we'll really need to be careful with anything that could start a fire. Morning temperatures are similar to slightly higher than the same time yesterday. Yesterday, but other than Jeju Island, most parts are waking up to sub-zero temperatures once again. Highs will be 5 to 9 degrees higher this afternoon, and Daegu and Busan should go up to 9 degrees Celsius by the afternoon. Well, southern provinces and Jeju Island will receive a sporadic mix of rain and snow over the weekend, while another bout of cold air moves in early next week. So up and down temperatures to continue for a while. Take well care of yourself not to catch cold. With that, here's a look at the weather conditions around the world. And that's all we have for now. Have a great weekend. Mark and I will be back for another episode of New Day at Arirang at 8 a.m. Korea time on Monday. I'm Kim Mulgan. And I'm Mark Broom. Thank you as always for watching. Have a wonderful couple of days off. Until next time, goodbye.